Galatians chapter 6 tells us, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Please be seated. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, our Lord, the Israel of God, that's you and I. That's what Paul is talking about here in this reading. He's talking about all believers of all time. And it doesn't matter whether you are of Jewish descent and therefore, to use the terminology of our reading, circumcised, or whether you are of non-Jewish descent and to use the terminology of our reading, uncircumcised, all of us who boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ are counted as the Israel of God. God uses this Old Testament picture, this Israel picture, to describe the reality of what it's like to be a believer in the New Testament age, in the New Testament era, the era of the New Covenant. And when it comes to that Old Testament word Israel, with all of its significance and all of the promises that go along with it, it's such a beautiful word to describe his people the Holy Christian Church, the, the, the all believers of all time church that we confessed just a little while ago in the Nicene Creed. And so the Israel of God is a New Testament concept for us. It's a modern kingdom. It's, it's God's people of all time. And God has created us and brought us into that kingdom and made us to be members of that kingdom. His Israel through the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross for us. And so we are touched by the word of God. The word of God tells us about what Jesus Christ did for us. We are touched by the sacraments which are contained in the word and, and connect us to Christ's saving work as well. And through that word and sacrament, he brings us into this Israel of God. I'm really trying to make the point here that we're in the Israel of God, okay? Is that, is that coming through? Okay, all right. Whew. All right, so we are in the Israel of God. We, we are the Israel of God according to Paul. And, and the Savior of nations would come through his people, through his chosen nation, and sure enough, Jesus Christ came, and he's the one that, that brings us all, no matter what nation or what age we are from, what time, not age in the sense of old or young, right? But what time we live in. He brings us into his kingdom, his Israel. Now, our reading for today is the first lesson from Jeremiah chapter 31, and I have a real shocker here for you today. Jeremiah uses Old Testament imagery to talk about this, and do you want to know why? Because he's in the Old Testament, okay? So, Jeremiah is about 600 years before Jesus Christ came. That's the time frame that we're talking about. And in the prophecy that Jeremiah is given is a prophecy about the New Testament age, is a prophecy about the work of Christ and the fact that he would bring us into his kingdom. And so Jeremiah, by the inspiration of God, uses Old Testament pictures to talk about the New Testament age in which we live. And we have this frequent phrase in his book, and it's often in his book. In verse 31, it starts off, the time is coming. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And as I alluded to, as I read it the first time from the lectern, the time is coming. What time? Time. What are we talking about here, right? And if you're reading through Jeremiah, if you're like me, you think, okay, what's he talking about? What time is he referring to? That's the New Testament age. That's what he's referring to, this time of the new covenant that Jesus Christ himself ushered in with the new covenant in his blood. And so he's using these Old Testament terms to talk about the coming of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ had not yet come. 
He is the bringer of the new covenant in his blood. And this is kind of a parenthetical aside. We get to remember that as we have the Lord's Supper today. That, that this new covenant, this New Testament church that we are a part of is what Jesus Christ brought us into. But we are the Israel of God. And we are joined together in this new covenant with all believers of all time in his holy Christian church. Well, you may ask me then, Pastor, that's all fine and dandy. What's a covenant? A covenant is an agreement between two parties. And, and covenants can take different forms. It depends who's going to do which parts of the agreement on the two sides. And, and we're going to see that there's a couple of different covenants before us. Verse 32, it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. The covenant God is referring to here is the two-sided covenant, the two-sided agreement between God and his people that he gave on Mount Sinai through Moses. And it was a pure covenant of one side keeps their terms, the other side is then going to be blessed and have their terms met too. So God says to the people, you do these things that I tell you to do in my law and then you will be blessed. You will be rewarded if you keep my commands. That's a two-sided arrangement. And he talks about it this way. He says, they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. What they had done is they had repeatedly, if you look at the track record in the Old Testament, the Israel of God, God's people, repeatedly acted like an unfaithful wife to the Lord. They broke the covenant, covenant, even though I was a husband to them. You can hear, hear the pain of God as he proclaims this through Jeremiah, his prophet. So there was not a good track record of keeping the covenant. And we don't want to cast stones, right? Because we know the old saying, you don't cast stones when you live in a glass house, right? All right? We don't want to do that because we know our track record when it comes to keeping God's will perfectly our whole lives all the time. It's not good either because all of us have sinned and we all need a Savior from our sin. So the reason that Christ had to come was because all people broke God's will. All people failed to measure up to the covenant. And for our purposes today, that means we failed. We need a Savior from all of our sin, too. So Jesus came and was subject to that old covenant, to the law that God gave on Mount Sinai, and he did what we could not do as the perfect Son of God and Son of Man. He did it. He fulfilled it. He kept it perfectly. He did the old covenant to God's satisfaction, and it was wonderful. And God loved him for it. And, and, and that is what he did for us on our behalf in our place. And he did what no one else could do. Now we get this new covenant that Jesus Christ gives to us. And once again, it's a two-sided arrangement that as well. But God made sure to handle both sides, both sides, so that he got the intended result. He wanted to make sure that what he wanted to happen was going to happen. So he keeps both sides of the agreement this way. Uh, Jesus did everything perfectly for us in our place, so he is going to keep the law for us, and God is going to give us the blessings. He's going to give us the blessings through the gift of faith that he gives us in his Holy Spirit so that we hold on to those promises and hold on to that good news that Jesus Christ is our Savior from sin. And so God makes sure that nothing when it comes to our salvation is contingent upon our merit contingent upon our works, contingent upon our ability, contingent upon our perfection, contingent upon what we do, nothing. He did it all. 
And in doing both sides then, saying, I'm going to make sure that you have all the blessings and I'm going to make sure there's a reason you have all the blessings because I'm going to do it all, we are sure and certain of this good salvation that Jesus Christ has won. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. The truth that salvation is not contingent upon what we do is the by faith alone, which is our middle sash in the, in the church today, by faith alone heritage we have from the Lutheran Reformation. And it had to happen. The, the Reformation is a historical necessity. Think about what happened with Jeremiah. Jeremiah is in the 7th century B.C. Now, that whole century stuff would always confuse me. 600s B.C., 7th century B.C., right? 7th century B.C., and what does God say? There's going to be this new covenant. This time is coming. Jesus is coming. He's coming. And he's going to do all of this. And he's going to give it to you. And, and I'm, going to, I'm going to create faith in the hearts of believers. And, and it's all going to be my doing. And then we look at the 16th century A.D. church, in which Martin Luther was a part of, the 1500s, 16th century A.D. church. And that covenant, that new covenant, is being buried by people going back to the old covenant in the church. The visible church was saying, well, it's not by faith alone that we get to heaven. It's by what we do. It's by our works. It's how we contribute to our salvation that we have the certainty of our salvation. And God had prophesied through Jeremiah centuries before that that's not the way the church was going to work. So it was a theological necessity, necessity for the Reformation to happen because the truths of the new covenant had to be proclaimed because God said they were going to be proclaimed, that this was simply just how it worked. And the old covenant then, what was it designed for? It was designed to put the need for the Savior in front of people. People knew they needed a Savior. Why? Because they couldn't keep the law. They couldn't be perfect. They couldn't be good enough for God. And it also pointed back to the promise of faith that God had given before that old covenant, all the way back to Abraham, the faith of Abraham. And here's the saddest part about Christendom today, as we sang about it in our hymn. Christendom today, much of it, still tries to approach God on the basis of the old covenant. It tries to approach God on the basis of doing, on the basis of works, on the basis of our merit, instead of what preceded the old covenant and what the old covenant points to, the need for a Savior and God's gift of grace. Now, we can even feel that tug in our own hearts because it's in step with our sinful nature. God will bless me if, if I just fill in the blanks. It's almost like we scorekeeper, bargain with God. God, you're going to have to give me a, if, what I want if I do this thing for you or if I can make you happy with me. That's old covenant thinking. Do we really want to go there? Do we really want to make it a meritocracy when it comes to our relationship with God? Do we really want to make it about our works and scorekeeping? And the answer is no. We do not want to do that. Because anytime we, we devolve into scorekeeping, anytime we go back to the old covenant, what we are doing is we are forgetting the score. Right? We have to be delusional to think that that's going to work that that is going to help us or merit us anything. When we think, God, if you, you'll do what I want if you just, if I just, and if we try to keep score like that, we're being unrealistic, and at worst, we are in the danger of hellfire. Here's what happens. We score keep in God's eyes, and what's the entire Old Covenant designed to do? To show us that we need help. 
It was pointing forward to Jesus who would make the ultimate sacrifice for us. And, and what were all those sacrifices for in the Old Covenant? We make sacrifice. Why? Because we've sinned. And why did we have to make that sacrifice? Because we've sinned. For whatever reason, that's a disconnect in our mind. And then, okay, why is there more sacrifice? Because we've sinned more. And it's always this idea of I can make a step forward with sacrifice and two steps back, right, with my sin. We are always falling farther and farther behind if we try to bargain with God and approach him on the basis of our merit and our work, which is exactly how the entire visible church functioned at the time of Martin Luther. That's what Christianity had turned into. And it was a lie. And it was awful. There's never any comfort. There's never any knowledge that we're ever good enough. We're always guilty. We're always dealing with these heavy weights when it comes to our relationship with God when we approach him on that basis. And then, the worst delusion of all, that God owes me salvation because I'm good enough? That's damnable. It's damnable. And so that's what was going on in the visible church at the time of the Reformation. It's the same thing that affects our hearts as well. Now, Jesus Christ, the good news of him crucified for sinners, when that thinking is happening, it is turned to nothing more than a new law, right? Jesus Christ and him crucified for sinners is the thing that just gets us going on the path of being a real Christian and then we can live for God and do the real Christian thing. And when we're doing that, what we are doing is instead of stepping forward in our Christian living, we are stepping back away from the new covenant that Jesus Christ has given to us and are back into that old covenant, trying to earn our salvation, trying to make God happy with us, always, always, always wondering. The time to come is in our reading. The time is coming, declares the Lord. And that time to come is still the time that is coming right now. We are living under the new covenant. We are living in the New Testament age. We are living under Jesus Christ with all of its blessed effects and all of its certain effects as well. And the Israel of God, his people, is still growing in this New Testament age until the last believer is called into his kingdom and the trumpet sounds and we celebrate the end of time that Jesus Christ brings us to the glories of his eternal life. And as we live in this age, we are in a constant need of reforming our hearts by the truth of by faith alone. We are saved by faith alone. God is the object of our faith. God is the giver of our faith. And the new covenant is that we trust, we believe. That's what faith is. We put our stock in the fact that Jesus Christ has kept the law perfectly for us and that we do not have to earn anything and that it is a free gift by faith alone we have been saved. That's the covenant that we live under as believers. That's the blood that we're going to drink today, the blood of that covenant. Okay, thanks, Pastor. Great history lesson. So what? So what? Here's why this matters so much for us. As believers, Bible-believing, New Testament, New Covenant believers, the Israel of God. We are in a joyous place. We are in a place that is free from guilt. We are free from having to earn anything. We have the certainty of our salvation. We have a relationship with God. The loving God, the only God, the saving God. That is what it means for us to be under the new covenant, to be part of this. So, when we are feeling guilty 
and weighed down when we were having those thoughts of, am I good enough for God? Could God possibly like me? Right? It, have I done enough? Have I done enough? I mean, goodness, I couldn't have done enough for him. He can't be happy with me or I've failed. Well, we are under the new covenant. Jesus has paid for those sins. Our guilt is atoned for. We have a relationship, a real relationship with the only saving God. And the joy of our salvation is in the fact that the salvation is done. It's complete. We are in the Israel of God. And it gets better for us as we go to heaven someday. That's what it means to have this heritage, this, this reformation heritage handed down to us because we are saved by faith alone. And the kingdom of God is still coming. The time is still coming. And it's coming among us. And it will come until the end of time. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Amen.